abbiamo appunto la professoressa Iacobu che ci parlerà invece appunto di cibo. Prego. Io me ne ritorno in piedi, là, diciamo, con una sorta di tagliato. <ride> Thus, a search for Asiatic or minoran Mycenaean expressions of statehood in Cyprus would be misplaced. I have borrowed this excerpt from Professor Peltonbrook's classic paper from isolation to state formation in Cyprus because it encapsulates in two straightforward sentences all that is necessary to know in advance of approaching Cyprus in the Bronze Age or in the Iron Age. With this key message in mind, I will try to respond to the call of our meeting as literally as possible. The number one task that Marco has given us is to present the first evidence which points to the initiation of a complex organization. As regards Cyprus, this evidence does not first appear in the Iron Age. Almost to the end of the 20th century, Scholars associated the development of the first complex organization on the island exclusively with the late Bronze Age, and especially with the Amarna period and the copper trade. In fact, the 13th century BC has often been described as the climax of Cypriot urban formation. Today, however, following dramatic and fast-paced developments in Cypriot archaeology, it is unanimously recognized that the first cycle of social complexity was initiated around the middle of the third millennium. It is known as the Filia early Cypriot from the site name where it was first identified. The first cycle was annihilated around 2200 BC before it could develop into a robust urban system. You may wonder why I have chosen to dwell on this early cycle 
since in the end it did not develop into a fully blown urban settlement pattern, nor did it produce political organization? The answer is because from this mid third millennium episode, we can begin to recognize that time and again, the same set of circumstances caused the development, but also the demise of, of urbanism on the island. If we analyze this episode, we can grasp the strengths and the weaknesses of the island's urban system. So, how was this first cycle initiated? We observe an island-wide transformation of the settlement pattern that puts an end to the long prehistoric roundhouse culture of Cyprus. All site locations associated with Chalcolithic villages were abandoned in favor of new locations. The villages of the Filia system were established in good agricultural terrain and near copper bearing ore bodies. This new demography is associated with the introduction of the cattle and the plow, and also the donkey, the transportation animal. There is no doubt that these transformations were helped by an external input, especially as regards the fast introduction of new technologies associated with farming and copper working. For instance, we can see that there were metalsmiths who had access to imported tin and had the expertise required to produce arsenical coppers. How do we explain these revolutionary transformations? Filiarly system metal artifacts are closely related to Western and Central Anatolian types. In fact, the complex metal industry developed soon after the mid-third millennium in Cyprus is not very different from the so-called metal shock visible in the Aegean in early bronze too. Ceramic parallels also point to the same direction, apparently because Western Anatolia was the nexus of these interaction spheres. Although it is not recognized that the Cypriot copper resources were at the heart of the developments, the leading researchers do not see eye to eye as to the role of the external impact. Some give greater credit to indigenous initiatives. The key feature of this inflow, says Peltenburg, is that we're dealing almost exclusively with adaptations, not imports. And this suggests more explicitly proactive behaviors on behalf of the local island communities. Others, on the other hand, suggest that the transformations were associated with the inflow of people from Anatolia who were skilled metal workers and also had expertise in handling new kinds of animals. Webb and Frankel, in particular, support an actual migration from Anatolia. The dissension over the character of the external input on Cypriot urban developments is not peculiar to the interpretation of the early Bronze Age complexity. The same controversy has raged over the so-called Mycenaean and Phoenician colonizations in the late Bronze Age and in the early Iron Age, respectively, to which we will return in the epilogue of this communication. But otherwise, nobody doubts that the first rise of social complexity is directly linked to the participation of Cyprus in the interregional metals trade, that it was and it that was the north coast of the island that undertook the leading role in this context. The site of Vasilia was clearly the gateway and its prominence was directly related to its ready access to the rich copper ore bodies of the northern Trudos Mountains. But why then did the Filiari Cypriot communities and Vasilia in particular fail to develop into urban <coughs> polities. Having associated the rise of com complexity with the long distance trade in metals, we now have to identify what caused the interruption of this incipient social complexity. We all recognize the ominous chronology of 2200 BC, which marked collapse and 
decline in Anatolian Aegean at the end of early Bronze II. The severe drought associated with this episode must have caused environmental degradation across the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond. Following the collapse of maritime trade and the loss of external markets, the intensity of mining and metalworking in Cyprus was seriously reduced and Vasilia lost its significance as a coastal gateway and its control of internal networks. As we will see shortly, the most successful Cypriot polities in the late Bronze Age and in the Iron Age were primarily coastal emporia, which controlled island networks through which copper was transported to the coast for export. Consequently, the demise of the Villa system interrupted a process that would have led to the rise of an early Cypriot state based on the North Coast. It is interesting to see that the demise of the contemporary early Hellenic corridor house culture on mainland Greece, think of Lerna for instance, also nullified steps progressively taken towards the establishment of state level polities. We therefore begin to recognize the high degree of dependence that Cypriot social complexity had on contact and trade with the larger scale Mediterranean civilizations. This was a constant and regulating factor of Cypriot urban formation. The same dependence on Mediterranean maritime trading systems triggered the rise, but also the demise of the late Bronze Age Cypriot polities, to which we will now turn our attention. I have to say that for an archaeologist like me, who works in the proto-historic horizons of the second and the first millennia BC, it is shockingly disturbing to have to acknowledge that external disruptions a thousand years apart from each other, associated with the collapse of urban institutions from Mesopotamia all the way to the Aegean, could impact so heavily on the Cypriot urban structure, because Cypriot polities relied heavily on trade. But this should make us ask, why did the Cypriot communities allow themselves to be so vulnerable due to extreme dependence on the product of a heavy industry and to its long distance trading pattern? The reason behind this excessive investment of the Cypriot polities in the mining industry has preoccupied my research for many years. On the one hand, it has made me study the island diachronically in terms of its immutable properties. On the other hand, it has led me to look towards the other big islands of the Mediterranean that had different managing, management plans. Crete, for example, which is an island slightly smaller in size than Cyprus, has no metal deposit. Yet, it developed a complex, palace-based culture from as early as the beginning of the 7th millennium based on the management of agricultural products, primarily olive oil. Due to their autarky stables, the Cretan polities could survive and retain their urban status, even if they had to stay away of international exchange systems. Actually, the 40-plus mini-state of Iron Age Crete did not participate in the Mediterranean exchange economy. This, however, was not a choice that a Cypriot polity could have taken because it could not make agricultural surpluses the linchpin of its urbanization. Cyprus was, and still is, hostage to a semi-arid climate zone. Aridity and the repeated occurrence of droughts are intransigent in characteristics because on account of its position Cyprus receives fewer loads and the air masses are not prodigious in their rainfall potentialities. The olive tree and the vine can grow from one end of Crete to the other, but not in Cyprus, where soil coverage is different from one region to the next. An official soil map of soil fertility reveals the extent of waste areas. A direct consequence of this problem 
is that the size of the population density has always been low compared to its size. It passed the half million only in the second half of the 20th century. But until then, migration, sometimes of entire communities, has been a constant phenomenon. And it has led to the establishment of immigrant communities all over the world. These facts help us realize that the rise of the impressive social complexity we see in the late Bronze Age, and again in the archaic and classical periods in Cyprus, did not depend on the regular bulk export of agricultural services. I emphasize regular and bulk because surely during climatically favorable periods, Cypriots did export some agricultural products. <coughs> but staples would have been secondary to the primary export commodity, which would have been copper. The long-term existence of prominent urban centers relied on successful economy and the most readily visible fingerprint of this economic activity is found in the four million tons of slag heaps, the waste product of 200,000 tons of copper extracted in antiquity. No wonder that the island's name became synonymous with copper during the Roman era. We tend to associate this impressive economic boom with the late Bronze Age, but in fact, most of the calibrated dates for copper working come from the first period, from the Iron Age. The wealth of the Iron Age polities, which are usually referred to as the Cypriot kingdoms, was directly linked to the export of raw metal and also finished product, finished objects in metal. And this, this is amply confirmed by textual material and also by the material data. Since the basic economic model, which gave life to state centers on the island, was the same throughout antiquity, I strongly maintain that we should study the late Bronze Age and the Iron Age of Cyprus as a continuum and not in isolation of each other. Despite the Amarna correspondence and the Hittite and Ugaritic texts, that support the rule of a single Cypriot Sharu king, the assumption that Cyprus, a real central state known as Alachia in the second millennium, while in the first was fragmented into as many as ten microstates, is not supported by the local material record. To begin with, there is no royal symbolism in the late Bronze Age, leading us to a central state. There is no evidence for the maintenance of a formal state archive anywhere, not even in Ekron, which is a day sailed from Ugarit, where our <coughs> senior correspondence was carefully saved and stored in archives. There is no evidence for a homogeneous record keeping system, the sine qua non, for the management of a surplus and redistributed economy. And the absence of ceilings is particularly problematic in view of a sizable corpus of late Cypriot cylinder seals. Indeed, their material and iconography would suggest that they were owned by hierarchically run groups of seal bearers. Last but not least, the Cypriots did not make use of the shared medium of economic transactions and diplomatic correspondence, which was a cuneiform script. Instead, they developed their own scribal system, the Cipromainon. But the lack of conformity in the use of the Cipromainon in the different urban centers of Cyprus implies that writing did not develop into a standardized system. It was not in the hands, let's say, of palace or temple-based scribes. Alashiya was an integral part of the international economic system of the late Bronze Age. And evidently, there was a primus inter pares, who undertook transactions and diplomatic correspondence with the heads of the Mediterranean states. But we have no evidence in support of the physical center of a central state. The massive quantities of copper that were being exported were not produced by a central government. The material expressions 
of Cypriot urban formation, and especially the settlement pattern, suggests the contemporary development of late Bronze Age polities around the island. Each polity was a complex mosaic of industrial sites, agricultural support villages, inland towns, and coastal distribution and export centers. That's the Cypriot policy. This segregated political geography was not only economically viable, but also long-lived. It did not decline. It was terminated only by force at the end of the 4th century BC by the colony soldier. How can we explain the resilience of this system? The answer must be sought in the particular geography of the copper resources. If they were isolated in the Carpasia or the Akamas Peninsula, for instance, the geographical concentration of the ores in one or two areas would have led to a completely different political economy, the rise of one or two autonomous economic centers. Cyprus, however, had as many as 10 kingdoms in the early 7th century BC, according to new Assyrian royal documents, and no fewer than seven at the end of the 4th century BC. The factor that made the decentralized polity system prevalent and rendered the island's economic and political unification unnecessary is the geographical distribution of the copper ores in a circle around the Trudos mountain range, which is one of the five richest areas in copper deposits in the world per unit of surface area. The ore bodies, inexhaustible to this day, are relatively close to the surface. They were therefore easily mined. The management of each economic territory was concentrated in an urban center, identified as a rule by monumental ashlar buildings with extensive storage and industrial facilities, such as those that we have been excavated at Calabasos and Maroni and Alassa in the late Bronze Age. Their functions, however, are not very different from that of the archaic and classical palaces of the Iron Age, where we also see extensive storage, metallurgical and also palace sanctuaries at Amethyst, at Soli, and also at Dali. We must now face a very critical issue. How did this urban system behave during the transition to the early Iron Age? In other words, how did the generalized crisis of the late 13th century, which caused the interdependent economies of major states to deteriorate, from the Hittite Anatolia to Egypt, the New Kingdom, how did this affect Cyprus? I hasten to stress that no Cypriot center was attacked by foreign enemies. We don't have sea people attacking Cyprus. The island's polities gave vastly different responses to this crisis. Responses that ranged from system collapse and total abandonment to survival and relocation in the case of coastal emporia, and even to urban enhancement and direct continuity of port towns into the island. The crisis that killed the Piyari in Cypriot a thousand years earlier occurred at a time when full-blown polities had not yet developed on the island. This late Bronze Age crisis, however, devastated some of the most prominent urban <laughs> centers in the Basilicos, the Maroni, the Kouris River valleys, and caused them to be totally abandoned. The abandonment of their central buildings, the most impressive built edifices constructed on the island until that time in the 13th century, it's, very, it's a very dramatic effect if you think that they were never reused. Nobody ever returned to these buildings or to these particular urban centers. <laughs> the collapse of these south territories occurred at the end of the 13th century, at the same time that two more major coastal emporia, Encomi 
and colossal dung decay, continued the trade in metals throughout the 12th century, and two more, Paphos and Kidion, were at that time busy constructing megalithic sanctuaries. Kidion and Paphos are in fact situated on either side of the depleted areas of the valley system of the Kuris and the Basilicos. Apparently, they profited from the collapse of their neighbors. The extravagant enhancement of their open-air sanctuaries at the beginning of the 12th century has no precedence. They are the first monumental cult edifices on Cyprus. Most importantly, their execution was the work of hierarchical authorities, authorities that declared themselves through the construction of sacred, not secular monuments. Thus, the non-matching settlement histories of the 12th century created a new urban landscape in which four coastal centers moved prominently to the foreground. Of the four, Halasutan decay was abandoned at the end of the 12th century when it lost its port facilities. The port mouth closed and became the salt lake of Larnaca. Thus, we see that the evidence from Enkromi, Kidion, and Paphos <coughs> suggests a close relation between cult, port of export, and the college. Appended to port facilities, the sanctuaries were in control of the export trade, a new kind of entrepreneurial Mediterranean trade system. It was also in the 12th century that Cypriot metal workers played a major role in unlocking the secrets of working with iron. Before the end of the 12th century, some of the earliest tools and weapons made of iron were traded in the Mediterranean from the Emporia of Enkomi, Paphos, and Kidion. <coughs> the one victim of the small-scale trading partner of the new Iron Age was the Cypriot Exchange Unit, the Oxide Group. Each weighted about 30 kilos of pure copper. It seems that it was withdrawn from circulation, most probably in the 12th century BC, since it is no, it is no longer recorded in the 11th. The Cypriot Incos found in Sardinia may have been kept for some time in the different ragis, but it is unlikely that they were made or traded after the 12th century. This is the period when Cypriot urban small-scale commercial traders were the primary agents of 12th century BC trade, and they linked up the East and Central Mediterranean in an unprecedentedly direct manner. In a horizon of population movements, as was the 12th century all over the Mediterranean, the three coastal polities which shoulder the burden of Cyprus's economic recovery, that is, Enkomi, in effect, the original site of Salamis, Kitio, and Bathos, would have received the influx of economic bad migrants from East and West. This was the initial stage of a long process that rendered Cyprus a multilingual island in the first millennium. However, despite the fact that the rulers in each one of the Iron Age polities made official use of only one of the three languages, Greek, Phoenician, or Autochthon of Cypriot, the island was not divided into three ethnic cultures. In fact, Greek, Semitic, and Autochthon populations shared the same material culture and had the same mortuary habits, which differ according to their social status, status as individuals, not according to their linguistic or ethnic identity. Built tombs, for instance, for the royal dynasties and the aristocracy, occur in Greek Salamis, Phoenician Kidion, and the Cypriot Amazons. Most important, the Cypriots had one religion. They worshipped the same deities 
despite the fact that they called them by different names. The Greek Heracles was none other than the Phoenician Melkar, the god protecting the royal dynasties in every city. So some years ago, I began visiting Sicily and Sardinia because I wanted to see how the colonial establishments of Greeks and Phoenicians look like. And it was not difficult to confirm from what I saw in Mochia, Sant'Antioco, or Syracuse, that we don't have colonial cultural expressions in Cyprus. It was not difficult to confirm that we cannot call any of the Cypriot urban states colonial establishments. The presence of Greeks and Phoenicians is not revealed in Cyprus by the, is not revealed by the introduction of ethnically distinct cultural packages. If we want to be honest, we have to admit that if it were not for the textual evidence, we would have never suspected the presence of Greeks or Phoenicians on the basis of material culture differences. The substitution of the term colonization with the term migration can help us bring into perspective the diametrically different targets that such population moves would have had. Migrations do not originate from the decision to occupy territories away from home and establish political control. Neither Mycenaean Greeks nor Phoenicians founded new urban centers in imitation of their mother cities after they had arrived on the island. Instead, they moved directly into existing urban polities. In fact, Greek speakers targeted directly the old polity of Paphos and Phoenicians the equally old polity of Kittion. But it was not before the late 8th century that Greeks assumed control of the kingdom of Paphos. And it was only in the 5th century that the Phoenician dynasty was established at Kittion. Moreover, neither at Paphos nor at Kittion did the rulers replace the established late Cypriot sacred architecture and cult practice with a distinctly Greek or Phoenician religious culture. Both kept the late Bronze Age monumental to many as the capital cathedrals of their respective states, which is not what a colonial government would have done. In fact, a long-term study of continuities and discontinuities in script uses in the territories of Paphos and Kidion, from the late Bronze Age to the end of the first millennium, can be proven surprisingly revealing as regards the transformation of social and linguistic identities in these two very distinct regions of the island. The discontinuity in the use of the Cypriot script in the territory of Gideon after the end of the second millennium and the sheer predominance of the Phoenician alphabet down to the fourth century suggests that the literate Semitic stock could have acquired a foothold in Kidion from as early as the 12th and 11th century. In fact, Professor Esa Amadasi has noted in a recent paper that the names of the gods Anat, equated with Athena, and Reshef, equated with Apollo, who are common in Kidion in the classical period, are not attested in Phoenicia in the first millennium. They are deities of the late Bronze Age Canaanite world which would suggest a very early introduction of these deities to Cyprus at the end of the second millennium and not much later. <coughs> we need to decompress the episode of migration or influx from that of state formation under the Greek Basileus or a Phoenician MLK king. These official titles had no relation in Cyprus with either Mycenaean or Phoenician institutions. Both had the same job description in the context of the island's political economies. They were the director generals of their polities metal industry. In the end, the only truly new establishment after the crisis years was the core town of Amathus. The polity par excellence of the autochthonous, the Ethiocypriot linguistic group, 
was founded by a regrouping of autochthonous populations from the economically depleted regions of the valleys of the Basilicos and Maroni, which quite understandably had not been prime immigration targets. It was therefore left to indigenous groups to revive the economy of this vast region where the royal dynasty continued to write its indecipherable heterocypriot language in the Cypriot syllabary to the very end of the 4th century BC. The long-term survival of three distinct languages side by side suggests that from the start of the influx, immigrants were moving towards established territorial states that had boundaries, and within those police boundaries, one of the three linguistic groups became prominent and claimed the state. Colonization has been repeatedly defined as a civilizing mission, the subjection and the, and the civilizing of the natives, as well as the act of founding colonies. But the island of Cyprus, during the transition to the early Iron Age, did not need to be civilized or urbanized. It had not become a tabula rasa. On the contrary, it was a desirable migrant destination. <laughs> It had urban qualities and state institutions, an active mining industry, and a stratified society that had developed and was still using its own scribal system. And we know that by the end of the 11th century, the Greek immigrants adopted the Cypriot script in order to write their language. No superior colonizer would have been in need of the colonizer's region's script. Thank you very, very much.